worst oil disaster in U.S. history has not only devastated wildlife, but also the livelihoods of many businessmen and women in the Gulf. Tyson Slocum is the director of Public Citizens Energy Program in Washington. And Tyson, I want to ask you, it's bizarre to me, while we see this devastation in the Gulf is affecting so many people, the rest of us around America really haven't felt an economic impact. Will we? Uh, we may in some circumstances. I mean, right now you're right that it is just a geographic crisis for those living in the coastal Gulf states, uh, particularly those that rely on commercial fishing and tourism for their livelihoods. Those folks have been heavily impacted, and the payments by BP so far have not been adequate to make up for their lost income. In terms of energy prices, though, the vast majority of Americans were not experiencing price increases because for all the hype about drill, baby, drill, the offshore drilling uh, moratorium and the spill has not sent panic uh, with energy traders. So the price of oil and gasoline have remained very stable. And even though uh, fish uh, from the Gulf of Mexico represents about a fifth of U.S. demand, we haven't seen uh, fish prices uh, increase uh, either. Let's get to that. Uh, I want to show you a chart that shows um, oil prices. This was last year. You can see the spikiness um, in past times and then extending out. Look, it's been pretty stable over the time that we've seen the spill. In past crises when there's a hurricane, if there's even threat of war, we see these spikes. But why not now? Well, I think it, it reflects the fact that the Gulf of Mexico is not a huge source of global supply and demand. Uh, we sit on a very small amount of oil here in the United States. And so while it might be big to a handful of offshore drilling firms, in the scheme of uh, global supply and demand, it's just not very much. We saw in the past huge uh, speculation-driven price spikes due to hurricanes and the, the threat of terrorism overseas. Uh, but now with Wall Street being reined in, the, the ability of those speculators to drive prices up for crises ah, like that is, is a lot li more limited. Interesting. You also mentioned the price of seafood. Mm -hmm. Many of us, I really expected to see fish and seafood prices skyrocket on menus. It hasn't. Is that because we get so much of our seafood from outside of American waters? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're still seeing a, a, a large number of imports, but I think that we might see a threat to higher seafood prices in the in the near future because we still have millions of, of, uh, of uh, barrels of oil that have seeped into the Gulf of Mexico. We've got hundreds of thousands of gallons of chemical disbursements and we haven't adequately measured what the impact uh, of all of that chemicals and oil have been on the Gulf of Mexico ecosystem. So I think the jury is out in terms of what the uh, total impact on, uh, on commercial fishing is going to be. So we, we will see a potential threat to higher uh, uh, food prices as We just as don't a know how much. Right. right. Uh, this is interesting to me. Despite the environmental damage, mm -hmm. um, and there's obviously a huge emotional and psychological toll that this spill is taking, amazingly, by some estimates, uh, because of the massive cleanup effort and the amount of money that's being spent on that, the spill might actually contribute to an increased GDP. Well, I'm not sure about that. Maybe in the short term, because you've got a lot of spending on contractors and all of these uh, folks, but once the uh, uh, oil is removed from beaches, the impact on commercial fishing is still going to be felt because uh, just because we can't see the, the oil coming up on the beaches, there's been a profound impact on killing uh, uh, marine life in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, I think tourists uh, w still may be scared away, particularly those coming from Europe and overseas. So even though we, we might see a temporary blip in temporary employment, for the cleanup efforts, I think there's going to be some long-term implications uh, for the folks in the Gulf. Uh, that, that's very serious. And we also have to look at the potential impact on, on federal taxpayers, because while BP has set up a $20 billion escrow account, that's not going to be enough. And if BP mm -hmm. starts encountering some financial problems, who's going to pay the bills? You of, think the taxpayers will absorb it? Well, I, I, th I think there's a risk to, of that. There's another debate about where taxpayers will be absorbing costs, and that has to do with the possibility of a clean energy bill. Uh, who knows if there's actually the political will to get something through Congress this year. But if there is, uh, do you see that having an impact on prices nationally? Um, well, it depends what kind of clean energy bill. I mean, right now, I think it's a no-brainer that Congress needs to pass reform over the way that offshore oil drilling has been regulated or not regulated in this case. Uh, we've got to have stronger protections for, for workers in the environment. We've got to hold uh, big oil companies accountable. 
Uh, but then there's, there's efforts to try to get a broader energy bill to talk about the long-term problems of our oil addiction, to try to incentivize clean energy, to maybe put a price on carbon so we can start addressing climate change. And addressing uh, uh, climate change, you know, uh, there, there will be some, some cost to consumers, but right now uh, consumers are bearing a lot of costs of, uh, of imported oil and obviously uh, the environmental impacts of our oil addiction. All right, Tyson, thank you so much for yep, joining us. My Tyson pleasure. Slocum, Director of Public and Citizens Energy Program. BP's image problems won't end with the spill in the Gulf. Folks on Capitol Hill are now raising new questions about something else related to BP. Let's bring back Rich Richard Quest from London. Richard, there are now questions as to what role BP may have played in the early release of that terrorist who was convicted in the 1988 bombing of Pan Am Flight 103, which exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. That flight killed two, 270 people, including 189 Americans. Now, we understand you sat down with the Libyan oil minister and asked him about that. What did he tell you? The allegation is substantially this, that as the price for BP being granted rights to, uh, to drill offshore in Libya, the British agreed to release Al Megrahi, uh, the only person ever really convicted of the Lockerbie bombings. To, be, to put it in its absolute sense, the BP admits that, there w that they were concerned that the prisoner transfer treaty delay was harming commercial interests. The British government has said in the past that commercial interests did play a part in, the in their concerns. However, everybody always denies that there was a direct quid pro quo for releasing Al Megrahi, who is currently critically ill back in Libya. Now, it's important to understand that bit of background because when I sat down with the Libyan oil minister, he was the man who did the negotiations with BP. He was the man who denies categorically that there was any give and take for Al Megrahi, for BP, to get rights to drill. And is there any indication that there's reason to believe these folks are being dishonest? There's folks on Capitol Hill who believe that there's something that's not being said. I mean, you, you take people at their face value, you have to. But just one other point to listen to. I asked uh, the minister exactly that. Was he worried about the senators and congressmen about to have hearings on the Hill? And I think this is as close as you're ever going to get to a minister saying, good luck to them. All right, Richard. Uh, impressive interview, impressive get. And we know you're coming back with a much lighter story next. And coming up next, the story is the man who claims